David, we're talking now about uh, chapters 8 and 9 yes. of uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, which, as uh, we've suggested earlier, is, is not part of uh, the other sections, right. it would seem. Seems, seems independent. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there one letter here or two, or how do you, how do you construe yeah. it? I go back and forth on that. There are, there are certainly breaks in it. It sounds at the beginning of 9 as if he's starting all over again. He seems to be repeating himself. He seems to have a different angle on the same problem. Uh, I think it's, I think it may very well be fragments of two letters. I don't think either of these is a complete letter. Maybe fragments of two letters. Uh, I've, been, I've spent enough time as a preacher to know that sometimes um, the way you make a point is to make it again from a slightly different angle, and it's not always a second sermon. I think people would go through and say, "Here's sermon two. And it's not really so much sermon two is now let me say it again differently. So I'm not persuaded one way or the other, nor do I think it makes much difference in the way we understand Paul's theology of giving. What in about case, you? Uh, well, I, I tend to fall down on the side of, uh, of two uh, mm -hmm. letters here uh, for the reasons you've indicated. Yeah. Uh, chapter 9 begins uh, in the same way. Yeah, as, yeah. It seems, it seems to start yeah, over. Even un unduly redundant. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, okay, so basically he's raising money. Basically he's raising money. And, uh, What's the background? Well, the background, insofar, insofar as we can reconstruct it, um, it, it's one of the things that I love about Paul, and I think it's easy for, for scholars and preachers to forget, and lay people reading Paul, is that his theological claims are very often in the service of some very concrete, practical issue. We've been talking about whatever's going on with the super apostles, but here the, the concrete, practical issue is his commitment to collect an offering from the Gentiles for the saints in Jerusalem, and it drives a great deal of what he writes. Uh, I think I think it's, if we went through and found all the times where it came up, it's hugely important to him and easily too easy for us to forget. So early on, when he talks in Galatians about his relationship to the Jerusalem church, it's clear that whatever agreement he worked out with Peter and James and John, uh, the agreement was that that he could preach the gospel more or less his way, but that in response to their blessing. He would also be concerned for the needy in Jerusalem. And I'm inclined to think, and I, I, this, is, this is a question for discussion, not an ex cathedra pronouncement. Uh, I'm inclined to think that by the needy, he means the really needy. Uh, there were some think that this has to do with spiritual poverty and um, just a nice way of talking about your fellow Christians. I suspect this has to do with genuine economic dilemma that the Jerusalem church is in trouble, especially from these chapters where it sounds to me like generosity has a lot to do with who, where the money goes. And so he, he agrees that as part of, his, uh, part of his mission, he will collect this offering for the, for the Gentiles. So you've got, on the one hand, his commitment to the, to the Jerusalem apostles that he will do this. Um, secondly, you've got, I think, his very strong conviction, especially evident in Romans, but, but evident in lots of places, that the new world that God is bringing and the community that celebrates that world has to be a community of both of Jews and of Gentiles. And one concrete symbol of this becomes that the Gentiles provide an offering for the Jewish church. That they're not, they're not just saved by grace through faith, but that's manifest by the fact that the, the Gentile believers generously help their Jewish brothers and sisters. And then, um, God, you know this better than I, but a scholar named Johannes Munk in a book I read long, long ago, um, thinks that, that, the, that the offering becomes symbolic of the claim that finally the Gentiles will stream to Zion. And in Romans 9 to 11, Paul talks about his hope that at the end the Jews will come back in to join the Gentiles. And Munk thinks this is part of that overwhelming hope of a, of a reconciled world. And so that the offering becomes not just a reconciled church, but the first fruits of a reconciled world. Right, and that hope for Gentile streaming to Zion comes from Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. not and Paul didn't Isaiah. invent this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. He he read Isaiah as a, a kind of prophecy of end time Absolutely. things, right. and sees right. that end time scenario being yeah. uh, played out in his own yeah. uh, ministry. Right. And yeah. no, I think that's right. Um, and we know he he, he was. Um, getting ready to take up this collection when he was writing Romans, right? He was, mm -hmm. he was, and, and, it, and it appears in 1 Corinthians as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing theme of his ministry, um, and we don't, I don't know more details beyond kind of those pieces of evidence, but uh, he clearly is very driven by having this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helps us to, to date um, at least this part of 2 Corinthians, right? It has to be uh, before Romans. It has to be before Romans, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Right, and the collection. They've collected, and he's on his way right. with the collection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and do, do we know whether the collection was well received or 
or not. Do we? I don't think we do. No, we know that Paul yeah. ran into trouble yeah. when yeah. he got to yeah. Jerusalem. We, we don't yeah, know what we, happened yeah, to the yeah, money. We right, we yeah. don't know, no. Right. So it's strikingly unclear, yeah. Right, so it's hugely important as a practical thing, yeah. as a, uh, an important symbolic yeah. uh, gesture on his part. Uh, so what, what's his strategy? for? Well, he, he's got several strategies, and it may be that the different strategies in different letters. But the, the first strategy in, in chapter 8 um, is, is what I've often seen used in, uh, in pledge campaigns in churches. Protestant, you may do it differently, but in Protestant churches, there's a kind of a competitive giving thing. So you see which Sunday school class gave the most or uh, whether the woman's society was as good as the men's breakfast in terms of their pledges. And you have little uh, bar charts on the walls and, uh, and women's society is up to 8,000 8, and the men's group is only 6,500. So you say men's group, you go to the men's breakfast, men's group, the women of this church are outshining you once again in their giving as they do in so many ways. So here he's saying, okay, Corinthians, just look at those Macedonians. My gosh, they've been giving generously. Um, in you fact, can do better. you can do better. Yeah, my, on, the, on the bar chart, you guys are way down there and they are soaring and it's, I'm a little embarrassed for you and I don't mm -hmm. want you to be outshone by the Macedonians, so shape up and give generously. Give generously, give generously. Right. So that's one strategy. That's one strategy. And that's in uh, chapter 8. That's right? chapter 8, the, the, the first part of chapter 8, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just as, as blatant and, and kind of... Uh, unsubtle as it seems. Mm -hmm. Then I think he talks about, at the second half of chapter 8, or beginning with chapter 8, he begins to talk about it in, in a richer form, whether he knows it or not, uh, in that it, the, the giving becomes, in a way, a kind of imitation of Christ. It's not simply to beat out the Macedonians, but you, you are followers, embodiments of this Jesus. And then that great verse uh, in, in 8, 7, I think it is, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, Yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty we might be made rich. That's a, it's a f phenomenally rich Christological theme kind of thrown in as an aside in the midst of how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis the Macedonians and how important it is to be generous. Mm -hmm. A puzzling text, I think, in some ways. Um, and let me, let me give you my read on it, and then I would love to have your response. I think that though he was rich, yet he became poor is not about the Galilean who somehow lived in luxury in Galilee and then gave it up to hit the road. There's no evidence that there ever was any such Jesus or that he hid away the three gifts of the Magi, right, so that he wouldn't <laughs> interfere with his generosity. I think, it, I think this is a word that he, like Philippians too, that in the beginning he was with God and did not hang on to equality with God, that it's incarnational language or a sentness language. This is the one sent from God. It's, Paul does not have a full-blown doctrine of atonement or incarnation, nor should we expect him to. He's a pastoral theologian making pastoral points. Point here is be generous. So here's my image of mm -hmm. incarnation. It has to do with generosity. Mm -hmm. In Philippians, it's about humility. So here's my image of incarnation. It has to do with humility. Do we have a Pauline Christology of humility or a Pauline Christology of generosity? No, we got two really great images mm -hmm. um, that help us along. But I think this is the the, in, the incarnate Christ, the heavenly Christ, becoming one of us and then making us yeah, I, I agree rich with you by on his that. poverty. Uh, for um, 2 Corinthians 8 and uh, 9. 8 and 9, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, the, uh, yeah. Uh, the poverty of Christ yeah. here, I don't think it's a, a social, I don't uh, physical poverty. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, referring yeah, to that yeah, uh, incarnational yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, pattern that we get in yeah. the Philippians. Oh, okay, so Paul uh, so, calls upon Christ as an example yeah, to follow. Yeah. Uh, that's all in chapter 8. That's all in chapter 8. Uh, and we have some other strategies in chapter 9. Before we get to that, though, we have um, a, a reference to Titus. And uh, what's he up to? Yeah, well, Titus is, Titus is I, as I read it, supposed to collect the offering, uh, along with two unnamed brothers, uh, beloved but unnamed. Why they're unnamed seems to me a matter of not great interest, but interest, we just, he, they, they're not. Maybe the Corinthians already know exactly who he's talking about, or maybe they'll find out soon enough. And interestingly, in an odd way, writes kind of the letter of recommendation he said he doesn't need. That is, a, so that Titus, I think, now goes with a letter of recommendation saying, uh, give the offering to Titus. But it, it reminds us of what we've talked about before, which is that Paul is not a loner, uh, that he goes with an entourage, that the strength of his ministry depends. If you read Acts or you read the end of Romans, you see how many people have been involved in making this thing work. Mm -hmm. um, and Titus and the two brothers are going to make this work and the Corinthians are going to uh, 
make it work by giving generously. And there's a little bit of defensiveness there too, isn't there, when Paul says we intend that no one should blame us about this generous Oh, gift. absolutely. And, and a little bit back to, is, was there on the, on the issue of whether I take money or not with the super apostles in chapters 10 to 13, is there any accusation that he's misusing money? We don't know for sure, but he's being very careful here. If I actually don't touch the money, then you can be sure that I'm always, not. We always have to be careful. We always money. have to be careful to this from that day until this, right? Yeah. Better. And then in chapter nine, we have some other. Uh, I, there's a little bit of um, a sort of banal, proverbial stuff. Yeah, yeah, going yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. The one who sows sparingly yeah. will also reap sparingly, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is, and 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 one can read that about a, sow generously, so that you reap generously. Uh, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, and you may always have enough of everything. That could be read as a kind of a prosperity gospel, that if, if I give generously to the church, then the fiat I've always wanted or the Maserati or something will suddenly become possible. You don't think that's a good I don't. I, 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 you've had much better cars than I have through the years, so <laughs> probably you're a more generous giver. I wondered about that. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't actually think that's what it's up to. I think, I think that it's, it's the, the blessings of God's grace and God's mercy and God's reconciling love and consolation mm -hmm. are poured out upon those who give generously, not as a tit for tat, but as a just um, faithful giving helps us do just what you were talking about when we talked about the letter of consolation, that we accept and live as reconciled people. Part of that is a matter of generosity. It's not that our generosity makes us reconciled, but that as reconciled people, we move into that world, the world of the eternal, the world beyond mm -hmm. the seen. There's also a note of uh, thanksgiving here, right? Uh, our giving is a form of thanksgiving. And, well, and a strong, in this, in this sense, finally theocentric, mm -hmm. uh, that once again we do this not just for ourselves and not even just for the poor in Jerusalem, but finally because our giving redounds to the glory of God. And I, that, from my bias, when Paul is at his richest. He'll come around to saying, finally, you ought to do this, and here's some kind of practical advice, or give this a shot, or you'll feel better if you do this. But finally, he says, we are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture, and if we are faithful people, that redounds to the glory of God. And as Christian people, we're in the glory of God business. That's what we're up to. So he has some very good arguments here and uh, very good persuasive He's techniques. He's got some great, great in arguments. The of, uh, yeah, a little, some... And some concern about what equality looks like, and I have mm -hmm. no idea where you go with that in terms of larger social patterns, but he clearly knows that there are issues about um, that if, if they give while, while they have abundance, then when they have less, somebody will be abundantly gracious to them, and we all, that's kind of pragmatic, but not stupid. Mm -hmm. Interesting that he doesn't cite any of those reasons that we have um, uh, understood to be underlying his, uh, his taking up the Not culture. a word. Right. Not a word. Not, not make the Jews happy with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Not Isaiah streaming to, with the people streaming. Not a word. Mm -hmm. Talking about uh, raising money, I was uh, involved in um, the United Way campaign uh, uh, at Yale. Yeah. And I was one of the champions of the, uh, the United Way campaign and used all of those techniques that uh, you <laughs> described. Course. Uh, and also quoted uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 7 to my colleagues at the yeah. Divinity School, God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> Were they all cheerful? Uh, they gave. That's all we asked. <laughs>